in thinking about child soldiers, um, as I've been preparing to talk to both of you, one of the thing that, things that really strikes home for me is about what happens when you look into the eyes of a child. So General, I, I wanted to ask you first, because you had direct experience yourself, what you see when you look into the eyes of a child soldier. So many very uh, intense emotions uh, when they are in a confrontational scenario. So you, you've got uh, uh, from uh, hyper-aggressiveness to fear to uh, uncertainty uh, and those, that mixture makes them totally unpredictable. Uh, and so you really don't know what to expect, uh, how far they will act or, or not. Uh, and so facing child soldiers is far more risk uh, taking than an adult where you can sort of discern how they, they, will, they will move one way or another. Is there any element of a child left in their demeanor? I'm, I was going to recommend you read my second book. <laughs> it is there, but uh, like, you know, uh, something can distract them like uh, chocolate or, or something. Uh, I, I think that the, the child remains, and uh, uh, it's it's not um, it's not gone because their brain is still a child's brain, and so the reactions are such. But they're at a, such a hyper level, and if they're under any influence of any uh, you know drug or, or booze or something, that will only exacerbate the scenario. But th there is a a, a, a human uh, dimension that we can go and reach uh, if we can diffuse the uh, the hype around the situation in which we find ourselves, which is very much what we try to do is is prepare people to not uh, escalate the friction and the intensity of a situation, but in fact try to diffuse it uh, to the lowest possible level that will prevent having to use uh, uh, lethal force as an example. Dr. Whitman, when you're looking at trying to eradicate child soldiers together, um, obviously it's not just dealing with the child. You have to deal with the people who draw them into this situation in the first place. But talk about the sort of dimensions that you have to look at if you're trying to eradicate child soldiers. In terms of the work that we focus on, yes, you have to have a holistic approach to this which means you have to understand all the different dimensions of why children are vulnerable to being recruited and used. And that means we have to make sure that we're not just stereotyping this as one particular situation. So there are children who are abducted, yes, and that tends to make the headlines, but there are children who join because they don't have many other options. They may be starving, they may have lost their family, they have, may have uh, been, uh, you know, taken on their way to school, or uh, there are various other reasons why revenge they might be seeking, or meaning that they're trying to find in their life as well. And so all of those different reasons, we have to understand them if we're going to understand how to address this particular issue and this dynamic. So when we're looking at it, it means dealing with the security sector, yes, who will be interacting with them, like General Dallaire talks about from his experience as a peacekeeper. But it also means dealing with communities, dealing with families, dealing with education systems, policy makers, and to all of the kinds of issues that can be really important for us to understand what are the root causes and what are the best ways we can prevent them joining in the first place. What makes children, uh, and I, it's a horrible word, but what makes children appealing weapons of war? What makes them child soldiers that, you know, makes them soldiers that others want to have with them? Well, in most circumstances right now, what we're seeing is the adults won't join. Uh, and uh, children by the demographics are far more available uh, and much easier to be able to uh, bring into the fold, either forcibly or through indoctrination or through uh, other means like uh, drugs and threats and, and or money. Uh, and so the accessibility of the children uh, is, is certainly one of the uh, dominant reasons. Uh, secondly, uh, they'll, they'll often use the fact that the, the children who are disenfranchised or so on may, may find 
uh, that this is an opportunity to, although under duress, but still an opportunity to, to, to gain a certain stature within that organization. But uh, I think that uh, what, what makes them uh, attractive to, to people is there's an ease of being able to control, which we tend to think, although when we actually discuss with them and show them the advantages and disadvantages, they realize that children uh, being used are, as weapons of war, as we see, are not uh, game changers. They're not, uh, they don't make you win uh, a war. They sustain war, they sustain conflict, they sustain fear and, and, and destruction, and ultimately can be pushed to extremes of violence and, and uh, atrocities uh, by the nature of their indoctrination. And so it, it is not the, the, the best weapon if you wish to uh, win a certain conflict, but it is an available asset that you can use to punctually give yourself a certain status of strength and mobilization. One of the statistics in your book, actually, that surprised me was the number of young girls, as well, who are used as child soldiers, um, and, and, the, and the kinds of roles that children are asked to pay. We're not play, rather. We're not just talking about gun-toting kids here. There's other things that they're required to do. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in fact, the number of, of girls is something that a lot of people don't understand. And you're absolutely right that it, that's where it's important to understand the different roles that children undertake. So the imagery that many people have in their head of what a child soldier looks like is a young boy with an AK-47, most typically African, but now maybe more so people are looking also to the Middle East as an image that they see. But what we have recognized is that children become uh, child soldiers because they are the messengers, the porters, the spies, the ones collecting the firewood, doing the cooking afterwards. And the girls have all of those same roles as well as being frontline combatants, but they also take on roles a lot of times that might be also about forced generation, creating children uh, for those commanders, and that can lead to children born of that situation who then become part of that armed group as well. So it's like a like a self-perpetuating absolutely circle. absolutely uh, Lord's Resistance Army for example uh, Joseph Kony was known to have at least 300 children that he fathered within that group and those are the kids that are the most difficult to get back because the only life they ever know is to be a part of that armed group and the stigma that they face when they go back to communities is the harshest that any of them can face but as you say, it's not just about getting those children back in some way, and, and you talk about this in your book too, about relating soldier to soldier. How do you persuade military leadership, government leaders, um, that's, that, that this is their responsibility too? I mean, how do you sort of get at the problem from that level? I think we can both answer to that one, but I, I, the, there is the, the nearly coercion by making them realize that uh, the use of children is now a crime against humanity and they're indictable in front of the International Criminal Court, which Canada participated in their own statute to, to, to bring about, uh, and that they are now, in fact, uh, prosecuting people who have uh, recruited child soldiers. So there's, the, there's that sort of hammer in, in the back there. Uh, I think the, the other dimension of, of uh, making people realize that the, this is... Um, is potentially a liability uh, to to keep the child soldiers and uh, how um, organizations can make that conscious to the community that using their children is is not uh, to your benefit of gaining uh, popularity, gaining support, gaining uh, reinforcement of your cause, but on the contrary, can in fact turn uh, people against you and isolate you in, in, in so doing. And that could even be with government forces that then end up by being not trusted by the population uh, and then undermines their credibility in regards to their role within that society. I think there's a, a few things that in our approach we take is one where we speak to the military, yes, military to military, and we understand that when we go in, we don't go in pointing fingers. Instead, what we do is we talk about the problem 
And a great example we have is when we were in South Sudan and we were talking to the SPLA and having a conversation with them. Instead of saying to them, we know that you're one of the seven state violators, we took the approach of saying to them, you know, all of these groups that you're facing, they're all using children. How are you handling that? That must be really challenging for you to be facing child soldiers. And putting that approach to it means then a dialogue is opened up. And when we can have a dialogue, then we can talk about all of these issues about how is it that children are at tactical disadvantage. And we walk through those types of processes with the soldiers that we're talking to and make them think about this from an, uh, an advantage point they had never thought about. Uh, the very first time we did this exercise on tactical disadvantages, I was in Rwanda and the M23 had just taken over in Goma at that particular time. We were 30 kilometers from the border teaching Rwandans and we went through the tactical advantages and they could all list the advantages of using children. Of using children. And then I took the sheet off and I said, now tell me the disadvantages to using children. And they looked at me like I was a little bit crazy at first. What is she asking us to do? And then we started to go through and I said, if a child is unreliable with intelligence information or secret information, because children don't have filters, right? They just relay info. Then if they will do that, is that not also dangerous to you that they could reveal that to your enemy? And then they understood what I was saying. And one of the gentlemen put his hand up and he said, you know, he said, sometimes these children, it's the first time they've ever left their moms and dads. And they're on the battlefield and they break down and start crying for their moms. And I looked at him and I said, and that doesn't make a good soldier, does it? And he said, no. And that's the point they were trying to get across to many of the groups that we're, we're dealing with is that yeah, no matter how hardened you make them, at the end of the day, they still are children mm -hmm. and they are not the best soldiers. What about the soldiers who come from countries like Canada who confront child soldiers? What, I mean, what are they equipped with in terms of, like, like you said, you know, you're sort of s s trying to read through that fear and their uncertainty. It's unpredictable because they're not adult soldiers who've been trained in any sort of formal fashion. How do you equip the, the sort of more regular military soldiers uh, to, to deal with that? Well, again, you can answer together, but uh, the essence of what we're doing is providing uh, professional soldiers, peacekeepers, and, and police forces, uh, even prison guards, because they deploy some of them too, uh, with a, a whole new set of tools uh, and experiences in regards to how children are used in order that it's not a surprise to all of a sudden see a child there and that they are second guessing how to react and that becomes an advantage for those who are using the children and uh, some forces have paid the price in, in lives of their troops in that, in that circumstance. I think that the, the, uh, the other dimension of that is, is that the, the, the trauma, uh, uh, the ethical and moral trauma of, of encountering child soldiers and have to ultimately find yourself in a scenario where lethal force has got to be used. Uh, more, uh, more often than not, up until we invented this new whole doctrine and tactical uh, toolkit, uh, the, the doctrine was is simply your, your right to self-defense and if you feel challenged then you use lethal force. So they, they were actually uh, using it and that impacts on our whole moral framework of, of killing kids. Knowing that they are, uh, I mean they're dangerous and they're high risk and, and they're using weapons and they can in fact uh, cause a lot of damage. Uh, but uh, to stop them and to use lethal force has a horrific impact on, on their ability to, to face their own families afterwards. And I've had the experience uh, related to the team uh, some months ago of a sergeant who had five missions and he, he was back home and when I asked him what his job was, informally we were talking, he broke down and he, he said he's been back for over four years and he's still not been able to hug his children because he had to use lethal force against children in conflict. And so you, you're, you're creating casualties, walking wounded on our side, that in fact then make them a liability. Uh, and that's one of the advantages that the bad guys uh, discern, is that if your troops are not prepared 
to be able to diffuse, react, to use new tactical skills. Uh, they simply go to the old method and the old method often escalates and uh, people either overreact or, or underreact or simply are caught off guard and then they lose the advantage of the situation. So what's in the toolkit? We have a handbook that's now on its third edition which is our manual that is used to guide all of our training. The Canadian Forces used it to create the joint doctor note on child soldiers that they released this year. Um, it's been recognized around the world. It has a set of practical interactions inside it and inside there you will see um, ways to walk through those interactions from a very practical perspective. So you encounter a child at a checkpoint, this is what we're telling you are the best ways of dealing with this situation. These are the issues that you need to be Can you give me an example? Of. Yeah, so for example, if you were coming up to a checkpoint and you saw children at this checkpoint, there are ways to de-escalate the situation as opposed to escalate the situation. And we would talk through uh, ways to recognize that if the child uh, demands to be respected as a, he's 11 years old but he tells you he's you know Colonel so and so then respect that give him the respect that he's asking for uh, don't hand over money though we don't negotiate with money because what that does is it sends signals to other children that this is you know monetarily beneficial to join. Uh, have a discussion with them and then if you cannot absolutely get through that particular area because it's too dangerous to do so, then you would decide to do another route unless it was absolutely necessary. So there's a set of interactions we walk through, sets of steps to go through and different ways to de-escalate that situation. Tell me about, the pl are the playing cards part of this? Yeah, so the playing cards um, are a tool that we developed, and yes, it's one of the innovative tools that we have, where w what they are is a regular set of playing cards, but on the flip side of the cards, you will see key uh, messages related to the roles that children play and different imagery, for example. Uh, key do's and don'ts um, on these particular cards, just things related to our vision and mission as well. Um, child protection codes of conduct. And the aim is that these cards were created so that when we trained uh, troops, we'd be able to give them decks of cards. And when they are in missions and they have a lot of time to uh, sit around without a lot of entertainment, uh, playing cards is one of the things that they would do and at the same time reinforces all of the messaging. That so they've actually got hearts and spades and... Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, so they're you just <laughs> regular, the regular playing cards, but they you don't help teach them to, how to play poker, but they, 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 Presumably that comes in their basic training. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think th they, there's, a, there's a, a sidebar to this that's of significance when we were in fact in, in South Sudan and uh, Shelley might want to tell when we were actually showing them two ex-child soldiers who had just been released. Mm -hmm. So we were uh, in a particular area of South Sudan and we had uh, been there with UNICEF to see children uh, who had just come out of uh, the Cobra faction and they were having challenges in getting those children to open up about their experiences or to even do things like draw to, to try to have some psychological and social uh, rehabilitation. But when we were there, I asked the children, do you like to play cards? And they said, yes. And so I pulled out this deck of cards and I asked them to take a look at the cards and they started to laugh a little bit and they said, these are very funny cards that you have. And then uh, children who were there started to say, oh, you see that one there? That was me. That's what I did. And another um, one of the boys would pull and say, that's, that's me. That's what I did. And so it started a conversation and later on that particular uh, school where these children were being um, rehabilitated, they contacted me and they said, Shelley, could you send us more of those cards? Because the children wanted to see them and they wanted to play with them and it, and it was allowing them to be able to have that discussion. And I think that's a, a big part of How what we do. How did you come do. up with the idea? I mean, it's one of those ideas that, you know, mm -hmm. has obviously been very effective. Mm -hmm. Um, well, basically, there? well, it was a team effort, yeah. yeah. Um, Josh helped to design them, but there was um, Tanya who worked with us at that time oh, as yeah. well, um, had the idea that 
soldiers do have a lot of downtime and what are some of the tools we could uh, create to help reinforce uh, this message and so we thought through what could those cards look like and what would be those messages on hmm. there. The federal government is going to announce some new initiatives about uh, child soldiers and presumably at its related to peacekeeping as, as well. What measures do you need to see uh, in that announcement, in that initiative, um, that you think will actually make progress? It, it has been um, an extraordinary uh, adventure uh, of moving from not only uh, helping prepare the Canadian forces for this new generation of peacekeeping, which is far more how to prevent conflict and conflict resolution from a multidisciplinary point of view. So giving them new, new tactics, new tools, new doctrines that, we, that we've been able to work with them and they're adopting in their training now. Uh, so you, you've got that sort of professional side that we've been able to bring forward and that we're already doing in other countries, in, in Africa, even in, in Jordan. Uh, but then the, the government policy uh, of, of, you know, what, what can we bring to peacekeeping uh, and what Canada Bay can bring to peacekeeping, because we've been out of the business for a couple decades now, except really a few officers in monitoring. And, and it was discerned that uh, as we moved the agenda of child soldiers more and more to the forefront as being a significant uh, security concern for forces that deploy, and also a security concern of being able to overcome to achieve success in these missions. Uh, the policy people, both in defense uh, and foreign affairs, but in defense, realized that maybe we have to take this as a element of policy to uh, inculcate into mandates and into actual uh, the framework of how we want to do the jobs in these missions. And so we ended up in the defense policy specifically, which is one of the first times ever an organization that's non-governmental, not an NGO, but non-governmental as well, was actually specifically uh, uh, identified and that the government said, we want you to work with these people to gain the skills and knowledge that they can provide you with. And as that continued, uh, it gained momentum and we were able uh, to uh, influence the uh, with the, the Minister of National Defense in particular, uh, and then also the Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, the fact that maybe this is something we can deliver to uh, the international community, the troop contributing nations to peacekeeping. And so we were called upon, and uh, Dr. Whitman in particular, uh, to help them uh, you know, articulate something that might in fact be of use to many of the two contributing nations and that's why we uh, see uh, that in the conference that's going to be held in Vancouver the next week uh, that they're going to talk about principles uh, of guidance to forces, how they're trained, how they're prepared, uh, references that they must observe in order to be effective in this new era regarding child soldiers, to minimize casualties and raise their effective. And it comes right out of right out of her, her head and out of the work that we've done and uh, it's going to be one of the, a, a, a key component of what Canada is going to offer the world is hey get on board with these people because they know what they're talking about in facing that concern security concern that is in every peace mission out there there isn't one that doesn't have child soldiers as a significant component hmm. so what are the principles Dr. Whitman, that you give me a, an idea of the sort of key principles that you think will be there. Yeah, the principles, uh, there will be a document that will be revealed which um, will focus on the prevention of the recruitment and use of child soldiers in relation to peacekeeping operations. So peacekeepers will now have a set of principles that we're asking nations to sign on to so that it's not just left at the level of the United Nations to conduct training and provide standards, but it's at the level of nations who are contributing troops to ensure that their troops are trained on these issues before they even get deployed to a mission. That these things start to become part of 
the natural fabric of who soldiers are. And it'll be about understanding how to interact with children in these contexts, just like we were talking about here today, giving preparation so that it's not giving the upper um, advantage strategically to the bad guys that are using the children, but instead those of us who are trying to stop the conflicts. Uh, making sure that we have peace processes that ensure that there's inclusion of provisions for children and child soldiers. Looking at women and how can the use of women as peacekeepers mm -hmm. be an important part of trying to address this particular issue because of their worldview and how they see uh, this issue differently than some of their male counterparts. Um, and prioritizing this issue amongst the overall peace and security agenda because we believe that that's where the world has missed its mark is it's relegated issues related to children to a sideline issue once we take care of the big issues we'll take care of this this issue after that and we think that actually if we put children at the top of the peace and security agenda we'd go a long way to reducing conflict overall and maybe that way we'll get a lot more traction you can get people around the table to talk about children. It's safe. Uh, they can negotiate. Uh, it's good politics for on all sides. Uh, and so you can expand that initial successes that you might have, uh, just like we were making suggestions, you know, get the people, let's say, in South Sudan, get them all around the table and say, we won't recruit anybody under 13. And just get them to agree to that. Uh, and as they're doing that and how to implement that and how to ensure it happens, the, then other factors, other elements get part of the discussion and it can expand. And you, you build on the fact that the children are a dominant dimension of the conflict versus an afterthought. Uh, and when they're an afterthought, uh, then you don't necessarily gain significant success in your negotiations because the security situation doesn't exist. Because the kids, uh, the children are in fact a, a significant factor in the insecurity and unless they're stopped, uh, you will continuously have people under uh, risk of uh, uh, going to abuses and, and using force and undermine every element of negotiation you've got. Hmm. This is a significant achievement. It is, yes. <laughs> thank you both very much for talking to me about this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Very good questions. Yeah. Yeah.